Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, I've got Jan Chapek from Brains and Slushpool talking about the new Bitcoin mining protocol, Stratum V2. But first, let me introduce the sponsors of the show. Firstly, look into Kraken, one of the world's leading Bitcoin exchanges. They're renowned for their focus on security. They provide a high quality platform. You can find high trading volume with low fees and no minimum or hidden fees. They also offer 24-7 support and just recently they've got Kraken Pro mobile app. Kraken Pro delivers all the security and features you love about the Kraken exchange in a beautiful mobile first design for advanced Bitcoin trading on the go. You sign up and you can generate an API key from the Kraken website and sign in on your mobile app using that. Kraken also offer up to five times margin trading long and short and they also offer Kraken futures up to 50 times leverage to benefit from price swings or to hedge your price risk. Kraken offer five fiat currencies. Go and sign up at kraken.com. Next is Unchained Capital. Unchained Capital, I really like these guys. They're doing Bitcoin financial services. They're empowering their customers with unprecedented financial freedom and control. They're using multi-signature and I think they've got a really advanced approach with collaborative custody, giving the users control over their private keys as well as a financial partner and financial services. So Unchained offer two of three vaults. You can use Trezor or Ledger. They're a great option if you want to secure your Bitcoin for the long term and if you ever need to access liquidity but without selling your Bitcoins, Unchained offer collateralized loans, giving you a unique option. All Bitcoin is stored on-chain, dedicated multi-signature addresses. It's never rehypothecated and you can share in the security by holding one of three keys. I'm really impressed with Unchained. They offer excellent services. They're releasing valuable content and open source tools such as Caravan and Hermit. I think you'll enjoy partnering with them. So go and learn more at unchained-capital.com. So previously known as Bitcoin Outlet, but now rebranding to 21x.io. 21X is delivering rare and extraordinary merchandise to warriors of Bitcoin. Outstanding design is not just blindly slapping your logo on any object. Every product they carry is a work of art with a thoughtful design, and in keeping with the ethos of Bitcoin, all products created at 21X are limited edition. Once that product sells out, it's gone. When you purchase something from 21X, you'll be one of the only people in the world who have it. So 21X is a sister company to Canada's Bull Bitcoin, both companies Bitcoin maximalist through and through. 21X only supports Bitcoin. This core cool belief has led them to align with other unapologetically maximalist companies. So if you want to rock some merch from a designer with an actual moral compass and unwavering maximalist views, go to 21x.io, grab yourself some merchandise, use coupon code LAVERA for 21% off anything in store. Check out givebitcoin.io, the easiest and safest way to get your friends and family into Bitcoin. You give, you time lock, and you educate. I've had trouble giving Bitcoin to people before because they lost it. They didn't know what they were receiving. That's why there's massive value in Give Bitcoin. You time lock that Bitcoin for one to five years and every month for the first year, Give Bitcoin delivers a lesson from a world-class curriculum with input from many well-known Bitcoiners, including Safedean, Matt O'Dell, Jan Pritzker, and others. I'm also an advisor with a small equity stake assisting with the curriculum. You can also get Bitcoin as a present for birthdays, Christmas, bar mitzvahs, graduation, weddings. Put Bitcoin on your wish list at givebitcoin.io. Remember, it's not just about giving people Bitcoin, it's about advancing them to the point where they want to become a hodler. So Jan Chapek is co-CEO of Brains and also working at Slushpool. So he joins me in this episode to talk about a new upgrade to a Bitcoin mining protocol, Stratum. And so Stratum V2 is the next generation protocol. We talk about how it can make data transfers more efficient. It's reducing physical infrastructure requirements and increasing security. We get pretty technical in this episode. So if you're getting a bit lost, make sure you check out the transcript. This is episode 128 and my website is stefanlevera.com. Here's the interview. Jan, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here. So Jan, I had the pleasure of meeting you at uh, Riga at, uh, for Baltic Honey Badger. And uh, I know you've been uh, doing a lot of work on Stratum, the second uh, version of the protocol. Uh, first, I wanted to get a bit of background from you. How did you get involved with all of this and working as one of the CEOs of Brains and Slushpool? So I come from the engineering background uh, and I started operating systems at the university. And back then in about 2005, that's where I met Pavel um, in my first job. Uh, we were working for a mainframe company. So it was actually not the, you know, the dream job that uh, a software engineer would want to get. Uh, and then our ways pretty much parted because I went for, for the embedded systems era because I was really interested in operating systems and Linux. Uh, and Pavel was more into, you know, the information systems, banking and stuff like that. 
But then we got together again around 2009 uh, at a random project where I was building an infrastructure and he was designing an information system. And uh, around 2011, we got the idea to start the Brains company. And our primary focus was developing uh, custom firmware for embedded systems, so gensets and, you know, uh, ECUs for, for cars and things like that. So um, that was the primary focus. But then in 2013, we got involved with Bitcoin. Actually, I heard uh, about Bitcoin around 2011 or 12 from Slush because uh, I met Slush uh, at some sailing trip. He was the best friend of Pavel from childhood. Um, but I wasn't sure like if this is like the, you know, the, the thing that I should be uh, spending my time on. But then around 2013, I really realized that this is something that uh, is going to change the history a bit. And at that time, Slush was already running the pool for two years and he was interested in moving over to a new project called, you know, Trezor, the hard world. Um, and he needed somebody responsible. Uh, who would take over the pool and got involved and scale it up because it was pretty much a small prototype running on one machine. So that's when Brains Company got involved and we've been operating the pool since 2013 uh, up till now. Uh, another significant milestone for us was starting the, the Brains OS, uh, the open source initiative for mining firmwares because we do believe that uh, since Bitcoin is open source, we should have also uh, the mining side that's actually securing the blockchain to be open source as well. So this is how all these things uh, play together. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Thank you for that. And with the different components, uh, it seems that there's this drive towards improving the decentralization and improving the control that the user has rather than trusting, let's say, the manufacturer by running your own open source uh, software, in that case, with the Brains OS. Uh, and um, so I'm interested also to understand a little bit around the background of how Stratum came together. So from my reading, as I understand, there was some of the early days, there was this concept of get work. And then later there was get block template. And then there was the Stratum v1 protocol can you help us understand a little bit of the context around that what are those different pieces and how do they fit together in the in bitcoin's mining history okay so originally the, the you know the miners were connected directly to the bitcoin core uh, the problem was that you know the solo mining wouldn't work because people needed a reward evenly spread out through time and that's where slush came up with the idea of you know, concentrating the computing power. However, the existing protocols to distribute mining jobs were not uh, sufficient. They would not scale uh, sufficiently. So basically, if a large enough miner would connect to your pool, you would have a big resource problem being able to, to ship mining jobs to, to the miner. So that's when uh, the idea of Stratum version 1, it wasn't called version 1 at the time, but the idea of the, the original Stratum protocol uh, came where uh, the pool would uh, ship only uh, the essential parts of the mining jobs of the mining job to the miners and he would be also controlling the difficulty of the jobs uh, so basically the miners were you know connected to the pool they were running on a long long-term connection on TCPAP connection uh, and the pool would be supplying the jobs and if, if uh, for some reason the miner, uh, grows. It has more hash rate. It's you know running this hash rate through through the single connection. The pool would uh, immediately see the change in in the submission rate and would try to adjust the difficulty for it. So this was possible with the Stratum protocol because it has this flow control called uh, difficulty. Uh, so that was the the major invention. And basically with with this uh, feature. Uh, you could scale uh, the amount of hash rate connected to your pool almost infinitely. Uh, at the same time, uh, this optimization or this, this feature uh, works uh, if you try to uh, aggregate the hash rate on a single connection. Uh, the current uh, state of mining, it, it looks like some farms do want to have like separate connections from every single miner, but still the, the pool is able to control uh, the, the frequency of submits through the difficulty setting. 
so that was the Stratum V1. So it was a, a major shift allowing uh, operating the pools on large scale. And we have been you know, using it uh, ever since then. But it had some major flaws. And one of the flaws was that the protocol itself was completely insecure. So it, it's pretty much text-based or JSON-based protocol. So any message sent to the server is clean, clear text, plain text. Anybody can read it who's in the middle of the communication. And anybody can change it. So uh, this is a big risk for, for the farms. And there have been attacks uh, through, you know, rerouting traffic through BGP or even now today there are malicious um, uh, routers in the infrastructure that actually are able to detect stratum traffic and they do some little changes and basically they can steal any, any amount of hash rate that they like. And if it's some small number, uh, you would not even notice if, you, if you're losing like 1% of your hash rate, you could say, oh, this is bad luck or there's some variance in my hash rate. Uh, so this is the first thing that we tried to address with uh, the new protocol. Second part, uh, we wanted to get rid of the, the text-based protocol completely because it's uh, not very uh, resource-saving. It's consuming a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so we switched uh, the protocol completely to binary with the Stratum V2. Uh, and... Uh, we have also looked into the construction of individual protocol messages uh, and we try to design them so that they're more efficient. So basically uh, messages in, in the original protocol that were like combining two things at the same time. For example, you get you as a miner get a notification about a new block and you're supposed to start mining on it right away. But uh, you can make this uh, a little bit more efficient if the pool tells you... Um, oh, hey, here you have a new block template, but it's meant for the future. So you as a miner um, store it, uh, the, miner, the mining firmware or the proxy remembers it. And then the pool only sends a small notification saying, oh, there's a new block that has been found in the network. So please start mining on the, on the block template that I sent you uh, some time ago. Uh, so that's the, you know, the, the different efficiency improvements. Um, Another part of the protocol that we try to address is that we wanted to have some, some uh, controlled and well-organized way how to extend the protocol. And that's why we try to uh, build the protocol around extensions. So basically any vendor, if they want to, they can design their own extension and they can pretty much run any protocol inside of it. Uh, Third efficiency improvement I would see is something we call header-only mining. Maybe this is a little bit too technical, but uh, the current mining protocol, what it does, it sends you a lot of data so that you can build your own Merkle route. Basically, you have to build your own Merkle route uh, because there's a part uh, in, the, in the block header uh, that you, know, you as a miner need to adjust so that you get more, uh, you get bigger search space. Um, this approach uh, is still supported in the new protocol because it allows some you know, advanced features like proxying and uh, switching you know, to different pools and stuff like that. Uh, however, we have introduced header-only mining where the pool is able to supply a full block template where you don't have to redo the full uh, Merkle root over and over again. And the benefit is that once you submit the result, the pool does not have to do the full Merkle root computation again. And so it doesn't have to build the Merkle root, uh, you know, it's the tree of the transactions again, which is saving the CPU time. But more importantly, it's reducing the latency. So uh, once you submit your result, the pool is able to, to uh, evaluate your, your result or your submission uh, really fast, which also should... Uh, end up reducing uh, the reject rates. Reject rates, uh, that's another you know, uh, parameter that miners do care about, uh, as they don't want to see too many shares, you know, the, the results of the mining that they're submitting to the pool being rejected because of being stale or for whatever reason. Gotcha, so sorry, l let's just clarify that there. So uh, you were mentioning, sorry, actually, do you mind if we just take a step back for one second? I just want to uh, provide a little bit of context for the listeners around the different pieces of the software if you will so maybe we could just outline 
the difference and what are the different pieces? So you've got the firmware that's on the machines, you've got a management system, and you've got pull software. So could you just outline a little bit what are those pieces at a high level and then how does the Stratum uh, protocol sort of work in with those? Okay. Yeah, I will start from the pool. So pool is a piece of infrastructure and a piece of software whose responsibility is to distribute mining jobs. Uh, it has to do it on a timely manner. So basically, it periodically refreshes miners with the new mining assignments, jobs, mining jobs, uh, so that the value of the block is, let's say, maximum. So the miners are collecting uh, as many transaction fees as possible. Also, uh, if there is a new block found in the network, the pool has to notify the miners that they should stop mining on anything that they've been working on until now and that they have to start mining on a new block template because anything that they've been working on after a new block is found is completely invalid and will be rejected by the pool. Uh, the goal of the pool is to reduce uh, the uh, variance in minus rewards because all, we know that uh, bitcoins are mined in blocks and the block is worth 12.5 Bitcoin now before the halving. Uh, you cannot mine one big Bitcoin. Uh, and this is the reason why the miners do connect to the pool. Okay, so that's uh, the pool part and distributing work from the pool to the miner. Can you tell us a little bit about the software that the miner uses in terms of their own management software and then the firmware that's actually on each individual mining device? Okay, uh, I will try to step uh, to the end. So let's speak about, about the mining devices first. Um, when Bitcoin mining started, uh, we had a situation where you were able to mine on uh, basically on your laptop. The, the original idea was one CPU, one volt. Uh, but mining changed since then. And it evolved from mining on your machines and your CPUs uh, to GPUs. Then the first FPGAs came. FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays, but to translate this, uh, if you want to design a chip or a piece of silicon, you usually describe the chip in a hardware language and then you synthesize it and you can test it on an FPGA. So it's kind of like a flexible development platform for for designing uh, chips. Uh, so this was another speed up in, in mining. And then the ASICs came when uh, somebody had the idea, okay, we're, we're now good with uh, the FPGA uh, and we can try synthesizing a real silicon. And then we got into this you know, performance efficiency race uh, since then. Uh, but why I'm, why I'm explaining it, is that originally you were running uh, a software called CG Miner uh, on your machine, on your on your laptop, on your, on your server, whatever, uh, and all the mining logic was uh, inside of this software. When uh, the GPUs came, uh, the CG Miner software was still being used, but parts of the CG Miner were only drivers for the GPU. So there were some parts of code uploaded to your GPU card, um, and the CG miner was only controlling this piece of hardware. Same thing was happening with uh, uh, the FPGAs. And then when the ASICs came, uh, even more logic has been moved out uh, of the CG miner. And uh, CG miner itself uh, is an open source software uh, using GPL licensing. Uh, but the problem was that people were not like noticing that th there was a, a shift in perception of what really open source is. And we saw that the manufacturers were producing something that was not open source anymore. Uh, however, back to the uh, role of this uh, component in the whole mining stack. So the firmware itself and the mining device these days uh, is responsible for accepting the jobs uh, communicated through a mining protocol and try to find the solution for such mining job. The, the solution is called the nonce. It is not important to understand exactly, but this is a number that you can plug in uh, to the Bitcoin block header. And when 
you do uh, SHA-256 hashing of the, of the Bitcoin block header, you come to a result, and if this meets uh, a target currently set by the network, then you have a valid block. Uh, these results are being submitted to the server. What the mining farm can also do is that if they want to save a bandwidth, uh, they can run a proxy, which is uh, a regular software running on a server that sits between their miners, their mining devices, and the pool. And these mining devices connect to the proxy, and the proxy aggregates uh, you know, the, the, the result submission to the pool. And at the same time, it looks, uh, with the current protocol, it looks like one big miner. So this is for 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 this part of the of the mining stack. Yep. And so then, can we talk to the different uh, pieces within this puzzle? So you've got the devices, you've got the proxy, and then from the website, you've got hash rate consumer and job negotiator. And then they talk to Bitcoin D. So can you tell us what the, what the role is of the hash rate consumer and the job negotiator? With the new protocol, uh, we wanted to provide a mechanism that would allow uh, miners to choose their own work. And the way we were thinking to do it, which was, the, the main idea was inspired by BetterHash because we're, you know, Matt came with the idea that uh, it would be nice if miners would be able to select their work. The problem with BetterHash was that it was not safe for the pool. You as a pool cannot simply accept uh, random work uh, because part of the work is also the reward for the miners. And the way the current mining works is that pool sends you a mining job that contains uh, the miner reward that goes to the pool wallet. And the pool then decides how you participated in mining and sends, you know, divides the reward from the block uh, according to your participation in, in each mining round. So it would not be uh, safe for the pool to allow the miners to choose even this uh, part of the block template. And that's where the job negotiation protocol came in place, where uh, the miner, let's speak about, let's say, mining proxy, so the device in a mining farm, can negotiate a custom job with a pool with a, a transaction set that the miner believes is the, the set that he wants to mine on. And if the pool approves such a transaction set, he can start mining on it. So this is the part uh, for, for the job negotiation, job negotiation protocol. Okay, got it. Sorry, can, before we go further, can we just take one first step back and just talk about that potential censorship angle that uh, Matt Corrello was trying to address with BetterHash? As I understand then, the idea would, would be that if, say, a few key big mining pools were compromised, then some transactions could be censored or potentially those mining pools might be having their hash rate redirected towards a, to performing a 51% attack. Could you just outline what was that censorship potential attack and then how Stratum is trying to help change that with uh, having the miners select their own work? Speaking to the, to the censorship attack... The feature in the mining protocol is there as a security measure to prevent something like this from happening. However, it is important to understand that even if you have this feature, it's still up to the pool if the pool wants to implement the job negotiation part. So if we have an evil pool uh, doing censorship of transactions, even if it implements uh, this protocol extension, it can always, it's not, a, sorry, it's not an extension, it's a sub-protocol. It can always deny whatever templates you try to negotiate. So your chances are that you have to go to a different pool not doing the censorship. So it is a security measure in a way that if this feature is needed, we can have pools that do support it. But at the same time, if let's say all the pools collude, and don't support this uh, job negotiation protocol, then miners can't do anything about it. They would have to start their own pools, which, uh, I mean, is also an option. I would see uh, the job negotiation feature or the benefits of this feature more on, a, on the business level where there could be cases where miners would be willing to pay premium to get their, their own 
feature, you know, to, 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 their, to, to get their own uh, transaction set being mined, uh, which they think is the, is the right one. Most of the miners are going to shoot for, for maximizing their, their mining rewards. So they want to get the most expensive transactions, you know, selected by Bitcoin Core. But at the same time, there could be some miners that do want to have a specific set. Yeah, okay, gotcha. And then are there any other attacks or uh, sort of vectors on which uh, the, uh, the current Stratum protocol is more vulnerable against? Uh, we have covered the man in the middle attack, but I can briefly repeat the, this part. If the current protocol was running over a secure channel, we wouldn't have this problem. But unfortunately, most cases, uh, it's not supporting any, any uh, you know, encryption or any authentication. Uh, so what can happen with the current protocol, the, the only and major, major uh, problem is uh, stealing the hash rate by, by, you know, inserting man in the middle and like alternating the, the submissions. That's pretty much it, I would say. Okay, gotcha. And so one other question, I guess I'm just curious as well, is how do mining pools know that a miner isn't faking it or bluffing in terms of how much hash power they're contributing to the pool? Uh, that's the whole point of the proof of work. So you, you, cannot, you cannot fake uh, your computing power because the, the mining puzzle, the proof of work, uh, has certain difficulty and the properties of, of this, uh, you know, crypto game is that you have to uh, use a certain amount of uh, energy in order to find the solution because the, the crypto puzzle or the, the proof of work uh, is pretty much showing that you have uh, used a certain amount of energy in order to find the result because the result is, is a random act. It's, it's a it's a random event finding, finding a result and the probability uh, of finding uh, the result is always the same. So it doesn't matter what you did in the history or what you, it doesn't, it, you know, what you did in the history, whatever results you had doesn't impact what you will find in the future. Uh, so it's, it's impossible for, for the miners to uh, fake their computing power because the, the result that they're submitting directly manifests the amount of computing power they have. And Maybe an important feature to to uh, explain is that the result is always associated with the difficulty that the pool assigned to the miner as a mining task, uh, and this difficulty uh, directly uh, reflects uh, the amount of effort that that the miner has used. But I can actually think of uh, there is a there is an attack uh, on the mining which is definitely difficult to prevent and none of the current protocols are able to prevent it because it is not uh, very simple and it would require Bitcoin to hard fork. Uh, and the attack is that miners who actually find their a block, uh, if they intentionally or unintentionally uh, fail to submit such block, uh, then it's called block withholding attack. Uh, then the pool has a little bit of a problem because they would not notice. It just looks like that the miner has a slightly lower hash rate, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to detect it. Uh, you can detect it only on a, on a you know big amounts of data and on big miners. And if the attack is, uh, let's say, crafted in a very elaborate way where it's distributed through many miners, uh, then it's... Uh, a real problem but this is not prevented by a better hash this is not prevented by stratum v1 or stratum v2 it, it cannot be easily prevented unless we have uh, a change in bitcoin in bitcoin uh, protocol so that the miner actually is not able to evaluate if he or she found a block or not so at the time of submission yeah Oh, I see. I see you. Yeah. So they would have to submit their work to the pool without knowing that they had correctly solved the block. Yes. Yes. And there are some proposals uh, on this, but uh, uh, there's no uh, solution. And the question is if you really need a solution because Bitcoin is designed around incentives. So 
it is not in best you know intentions or there's no good incentive for miners to uh, be withholding blocks because they're you know damaging their own rewards as well but it's an interesting attack on uh, specific pools for example pps pools could easily bleed out because pps pools are paying by share so basically if you solve the puzzle for for the pool on a difficulty set by the pool which might which uh, is much lower than the network difficulty you get paid for for every solution and the the, the payment is proportional to the current difficulty of the network uh, it can be easily computed and this pool pays out these rewards completely independently from how many blocks it finds so if uh, they have a big miner who is doing such an attack, which could be detected if, if the miner is big enough uh, using some statistical analysis, then they would have a problem because they would bleed out. They would be paying money, but uh, there would be no blocks found on their side. Or no blocks, a smaller percentage of blocks because the other miners are assumed not to do the block withholding. Example. Right, like the miner in that case is kind of cheating or scamming the pool a bit out of money because they're just getting paid for shares, but that they're not actually providing because they're withholding them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is a realistic attack, but uh, we didn't hear about too many be, uh, being, uh, you know, detected or uh, happened. Another case of such an attack is an unintentional block withholding attack. If, for example, you have uh, a bug in your firmware or if you're rolling your end time incorrectly, but in that case, it should be detected on the pool in a way that uh, such shares are actually invalid. So, I mean, there are different cases. So it doesn't have to be always an intentional thing. Or because the code path in, in the miner itself, it, let's say, if you, look, if you can imagine that there's a, there's a piece of code in your, in your mining software that's saying, okay, if I found a block, I just want to know about it. So I, I increment this counter. But this code path is not being executed too often, right? Like how many times your miner finds a block. And if the software is not properly tested, which for example, for the CG miner, there's no, there's no test suite available, then what if the software crashes in that exact moment where it's trying to increment that counter of found blocks and since it's going through a code path that is, never, that is executed very rarely, there could be a bug in there that causes a crash or some other problem. Uh, where the, the software actually doesn't get to submit the block because it's not running anymore. And this can happen. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, ho hopefully that sort of thing would be caught in a test uh, before the software rolls out there. That's why we're redoing the, the CG miner thing uh, called... Our project is called BOS Miner. It's, uh, it's an essential component for, for Brains OS that's coming out uh, hopefully for, uh, for uh, December uh, or end of December for Alpha. Uh, which is written uh, in a modern language and tries to address all these things and is uh, supporting Stratum V2 from day one. So, uh, yeah, we do, we do realize that this could be a potential problem as well. Gotcha. And uh, w while we're on the topic of different, these different pieces of software, could you just give us an overview as there are different uh, pieces of software out and about out there in the system, out, out, out in the wild? So as I understand from, you know, from your point of view, you've got uh, Brains OS, which is the operating system, and then you've got uh, BOS Miner, which you mentioned, and then you've got Stratum V2. Uh, but in terms of broader out there in the, in the Bitcoin mining world, I presume there are other pieces of software, as you mentioned. There's CG Miner, uh, and there might be there are other um, uh, protocols that might be in play. Could you just give us an overview of the Brains stack compared to some of those others? Uh, okay. When uh, we started the Brains OS initiative, uh, we have looked at the current state of the mining, and like I tried explaining with the evolution of uh, the mining hardware of the mining devices. Today, the miner is no longer just the mining software. You need uh, an operating system running on some embedded device, which is another essential component, which typically is closed source or is whatever the, the, the manufacturers publish is usually like incomplete. We started looking into this sometime around 2016, 2017, and we saw, oh, this is uh, not where it should be. I mean, if you want to run a Bitcoin core, you just download the software, you compile it, and you're a part of the network. If you want to build a firmware for your mining device that you bought for, for your money, 
you don't have uh, such great possibilities because, uh, for example, Bitmain, they, they published the, the BM miner, which is actually a fork of CG miner. So everything actually starts from, from CG miner in this ecosystem. Um, but that's only the software and it would be very difficult and challenging to find all the bits and pieces to run uh, the full firmware image uh, on the mining device. And the question is, what else uh, could be broken, hidden, whatever, compromised inside of the miners if you don't have the full control of the stack? So we try to address it with BrainsOS where you have the full operating system, which is open source. It's based on uh, OpenWRT, a generic Linux distribution meant for routers and embedded devices. And then we used uh, a snapshot of BM miner for, for the S9s and we started developing from there. So for the time being, the current latest release, which is somewhere from June, uh, still contains the BM miner. But in parallel to this activity, we also realized that we need to start writing a new software for mining called BOS miner, which would be a parallel thing to CG miner, bringing basically CG miner eventually to end of life. Uh, the reasons for, for doing this is that the current CG miner code base is very cluttered and it is not a very, very good shape throughout the years because what manufacturers did, they usually took the code base, they, they forked it, usually did some you know, breaking changes in the source code and usually never contributed it back to the original upstream CG miner project, which is also a violation of GPL, which I think is uh, kind of serious where you know, we're, we're dealing with money here and uh, people are willing to operate their mining devices uh, with closed source firmware that doesn't uh, you know, have proper audits. The, you, know, you don't know what it's doing. We had affairs called and bleed where there were backdoors from Bitmain allowing them to uh, shut down the devices, even though the feature was uh, advertised as a, as a management feature, but nobody really knew about it. We had affairs like ASIC boost, which is another manifestation of uh, the, you know, the, the firmware stack being closed, where um, uh, the S9s were able to, to, to do ASIC boost, but, but the way it was configured in in the firmware from, from the manufacturer was that it was actually disabled. And if you enabled it, it was generating incorrect results. So you could not really use that feature. And that was actually preventing you from saving 30% of energy. So these are all the reasons why, why we decided we want to build a full open source stack and make it a, a go-to place for, let's call it for the community. I would, ideally, I would like this to be a go-to place for the industry, somewhere where the Linux kernel is. If you want to build an embedded device, you go, you go to kernel.org, you download the sources, you know, you add your drivers and hopefully contribute it back because you don't want to maintain your own uh, fork of a Linux kernel, but some manufacturers uh, also keep their forks. Yeah, so this is so where the full Brains OS and BOS miner stack fits in. And I would like to say that currently uh, the Brains OS is still running CG Miner, but this component is going to be replaced uh, pretty soon. Great. Um, yeah, sorry to go back a little bit, but uh, you mentioned earlier rolling the end time. And uh, in my reading, I was looking, I was looking up this idea of version rolling bits. Uh, uh, could you give us a bit of a context? What what exactly is that, and is is that related to header only mining? Yes. Um... Uh, version rolling is uh, a feature that allows you touching uh, certain version fields of the Bitcoin block header that have been specified a bit in BIP 320, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And these bits are, can be used to extend your search space because currently uh, the, the way uh, Bitcoin block header has been designed is that it only allows you to roll uh, a nonce field, which is four bytes which uh, uh, a current miner is able to roll through in, uh, in milliseconds, which is like no time to even like supply fresh jobs to it. And then you also have end time, which are supposed to touch only every second, which is not fast enough. And then uh, you have uh, the version field, which uh, consists of uh, 16 bits that can be freely used. And this extends the space to almost two to the 48, if I'm correct. And that two to the 48 doesn't really mean anything, but maybe some people do know. 
S9s are roughly 16 terahash, and this space uh, is uh, enough to have uh, a miner that has roughly 280 terahash per second. But in that case, you would have to really supply jobs every second to the miner. Yeah, so, so this, this is it. Gotcha. And so as I understand then from reading, uh, it looks like the Stratum V2 protocol has this natively, this version rolling feature, whereas in the past, it was, it, this was like an extension to the original Stratum protocol. Yeah, this uh, originally it was an extension really meant to allow machines that were supporting ASIC boost only to operate. So the V1 has something called mining configure, which is an extension that allows to negotiate, you know, protocol features. And one of the features was to specify the number of bits that you can or that you are willing or need to roll as a mining device. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and also, you. Uh, sorry, we are jumping around a little bit, but there are just different areas that I wanted to jump into. So uh, the mining protocol, Stratum V2, defines three types of communication channels. So you've got standard, extended, and group channels. Can you help break that down for us? Oh, sure. Standard channels are meant for uh, uh, the header-only mining. So these are like the most uh, efficient way how to distribute work. And present uh, the least uh, load on the server side when, when uh, the pool server are ver is verifying jobs. Extended channels provide much more flexibility so that you as a mining operation can uh, run a proxy that's actually distributing the work in a way that you like to have it distributed. Uh, so basically, the extended jobs are, are somewhere close to the original Stratum V1, where the miner had to roll their extra nonce 2 field. And the extra nonce 2 was a field inside of the Coinbase transaction, which uh, was actually specified by the pool, like how much space I give you. Typically, the pool gave you somewhere between 4 and 8 bytes, which uh, extends the search space uh, for uh, the mining jobs for the mining job pretty much uh, infinitely. I, I mean, for the, for the validity of the job, the job typically uh, gets updated every 20 seconds. So it was more than enough to feed a, a big mining operation with uh, a job and then the mining operation would be able to generate like sub-mining jobs to, to its uh, physical miners. Um, so these were the, this is the extended job. Uh, and then... The extended jobs uh, can be supplied to standard channels or extended channels. And this may be a little bit uh, confusing, but to explain it, if you're running a proxy that wants to connect through standard channels to the mining server, uh, the mining server can send only one extended job to this uh, proxy, which is meant for all these standard channels downstream for the miners. The concept of group channels uh, then, in this particular use case, denotes a set of channels that this extended job is meant for. Okay. And help me understand here, is this the idea as well to help from a bandwidth saving perspective or is it a computational power saving perspective or what's the main uh, objective of these different uh, communication channels? This is, yeah, yeah. Uh, this feature is uh, meant for bandwidth saving and also for latency saving because it's for, let's speak about a, a, a real scenario. Let's say you have a farm that has 100,000 miners and you have a proxy. Uh, it's more efficient if the pool supplies one extended job to this proxy. And the, uh, speaking still of, uh, of header-only mining, so uh, the, the server is able to prepare uh, the Merkle routes for all these uh, for all these hundred thousand miners locally, but it doesn't have to send all these Merkle routes. So basically, sending standard jobs hundred thousand times for every single miner, but it only sends one single extended job, and the proxy then distributes uh, these uh, jobs to the miners. So it's saving the bandwidth, and it's also send, saving uh, the the latency, which uh, could in the end effect could reduce uh, the reject rate because the, the miner would know about the job uh, sooner. 
Yes, okay. And uh, you mentioned the reject rate there. And as I understand, that's also related with the stale. Uh, as I understand, that might be where, let's say, I'm a miner, and then the mining pool that I'm contributing to, they've already found a block, but I didn't know that, and I contributed some work after the fact, and now that work is no longer useful. Is that a correct? Uh, could uh, could you help us understand that? What What is that stale rate? Yeah, st- so stale rate or reject rate... Um... If, if you send a result to the pool or if you submit a result to the pool, the pool has to do the validation. And it can reject the, the share for various reasons. And one of the reasons is that uh, the share is no longer valid. I mean, it is valid technically, so it fulfills the difficulty that, it, that you have been assigned. But it is not valid because a new block has been found in the meantime and you're supposed to mine on a, on a new block. Um, and the new protocol tries to address this uh this uh, reject rate issue by supplying you with a new block template as fast as possible. And actually, it sends you the block template ahead. So you get a new block template with a flag, uh, with, a, with a future flag saying, oh, this is a block template that you're supposed to start mining when I tell you. And then when a new block is found, uh, the pool only notifies you that you should start using this block template. And since... Uh, the block template uh, is a little bigger uh, message than uh, just this small, small notification about uh, you being uh, supposed to mine on a new block. Uh, this also reduces the, the, you know, the chances that you uh, will be mining uh, on the stale job, on the old job uh, for longer time than needed. So it doesn't eliminate the, the reject rate completely, uh, there will there will always be some uh, you know rejection because you know this is essentially a race condition in in the mining, but it tries to minimize it to to the very um, to the lowest possible value. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you for that. And also with uh, sort of related empty blocks. So uh, as I was reading, it looks like stratum v one is slower to send a full block than an empty block whereas Stratum V2 has been designed to make it so that there's no extra delay to send a full block versus an empty block. So could you help us break that down? What's the Maybe we could just start with what is the problem with empty blocks to start with? I would say empty blocks overall are not a problem. Uh, you can look at it uh, from different perspectives. Currently, when uh, the Bitcoin network finds a new block, it is not a simple task for the Bitcoin core to generate a new template. It literally takes second, seconds. It, it really takes some time. So it's better for the miners to have something to work on than waiting and wasting the energy. I mean, and shutting down the miner is not an option because, I mean, you cannot shut down a 100 megawatt operation that would create glitches you know, in the grid. And it's impossible. So the miners are sort of like race cars. They have to go like full throttle all the time. That's the most efficient you know, approach, how you, how you have to run them. So you have to feed them with the jobs, otherwise you're wasting the energy. Uh, so with the current Stratum V1 protocol, it is better to, uh, for, for the miner to have uh, an empty uh, you know, block template than uh, not work at all. At the same time, with uh, the empty blocks, uh, what we were thinking about with the Stratum V2 is that if we can send uh, an empty block template in advance, we may be able to send a speculative block template that contains a complement of transactions that are not in the current, in the current block template that's being mined uh, by the pool. And if, they, if the transactions are shifted in the mempool by some offset, this could work very well. So chances are that if um, a new block is found and the miner actually starts mining not on the on the on the empty template but on a template that already contains some transactions that have been lower in the in the mining pool, if uh, somebody else finds a block, chances are that this template that you already supplied to the miners would still be valid, and then you're actually gaining time because you gave the miners already useful work that contains the transactions and you as a pool can start negotiating with Bitcoin Core to generate a, a new block template for you, which is like the current valid one. And then you just, you know, refresh the miners with a new template, which is uh, not uh, a real time process anymore. You don't have that, you know, deadline where you really have to give somebody the, 
the, the new mining work as fast as possible, the new block template. Does it explain uh, the question? I think so, yeah. And I, I guess maybe just a question to help improve my understanding here. So, for example, typically miners... Like if you're fee maximizing, you want to take the highest fee first, right? Uh, but then is it a possibility then that as part of this uh, template getting sent in advance, there might be some lower fee transactions that are being sent as part of that. And then you might, if you're lucky, get some lower fee ones uh, confirmed as part of that. That uh, that could be uh, the case too. I mean, the politics on choosing the, the alternative block templates can be different and we didn't want to specify uh, a policy inside of the protocol. We would like to leave this up to the implementers. Uh, I could see that the pool actually sends uh, multiple block templates to, to the pool, not just two, not an empty one and not a, a full one, but that could be like a couple more. But again, as I said, uh, we would like to leave this policy up, up to the implementers. Great. And so one other one I was curious about is uh, you've got here zero time backend switching. So as I understand then, this means that a miner can s switch which pool more easily that they want to contribute hash power to. Could you outline what that is and what that process is? When uh, I think I need to explain uh, what an extra nonce one is uh, first. Sure. When a miner gets a job, uh, the job is unique for uh, for that specific miner. And part of uh, but the V1, part of this job was something called extra nonce one, which was uh, a value injected into the Coinbase uh, transaction. If you wanted to supply a job from a different backend, let's say from a different pool, let's say you were a proxy distributing to jobs, with a V1, uh, you would have to uh, completely uh, restart the mining session or your miner would have to support an extension called extra nonce one subscription where the proxy or the pool was able to actually notify, you, oh, hey, there is a new extra nonce one, which is like the, the thing identifying uh, your mining session. And here is a new job. So please use it with this one. Uh, whereas uh, in the new protocol, we already do have uh, this feature we call an extra nonce prefix built into the protocol. So the, the pool or the service serving the job, I don't want to say a pool because pool usually has no um, incentive to distribute jobs from other pools. But in case of uh, switching to different algorithms, for example, sorry, to different coins, for example, you want to be able to supply jobs for Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, um, BT, Bitcoin SV or whatever, then uh, you don't want to harass the miners with saying, oh, please, can you just connect somewhere else? And then there you're going to get a new job. But instead of it, the, the service distributing such jobs can just notify the miner, hey, here's a new extra nonce prefix, which identifies your, your mining session. And here's a new job and please use it. That's it. So, so we have uh, built this extra nonce one subscription into the protocol. Okay, great. Uh, and are there any barriers that you see to miners adopting Stratum V2? Are there any obvious downsides or negatives that they might face? I think the, the one barrier would be the firmware adaption. If you want to take a full advantage of the protocol, you, would, you need a firmware that supports the protocol. So it doesn't go to miners, but it really goes to the manufacturers. We try to address this fact by providing the Brains OS and the protocol stack also as a reference implementation in Rust language. So it should be fairly easily readable, very stable, uh, and people can basically build their work on top of that. On the pool side, I see there are really good incentives for implementing the protocol because the pools would pretty much start saving bandwidth immediately, which would be manifested immediately in the quality of their service. They can support, uh, you know, higher submission rates. So the more frequently the miner actually submits to the pool, because you're saving on the bandwidth, you can technically use this, the data you know, to, to submit more results more often. Uh, and this 
uh, directly uh, is reflected in your mining rewards because the miner from pool perspective is sort of like a small Bitcoin network because it's it also has luck. It's trying to find a share with certain difficulty and at sometimes it has uh, you know more luck and some it's, in some periods of time it has lower luck. And the variance in the luck is uh, related to the difficulty that, that the pool assigns to you. So if you have a difficulty that means that you find a block every one second, so this one second is... Uh, because it follows the Poisson distribution, uh, I think there's a 63% chance that you find the block within this one, uh, sorry, the share within this one second. And there's like a 95% chance if, that you find it in four seconds. Whereas if you uh, are assigned a difficulty so that your submission rate is like five seconds, for example, then uh, the chance that you find the share within five seconds is still the same, 63%. Uh, so 63% of the shares are found at this time, and 95% of the shares will be found within 20 seconds. And uh, when you look in the statistics on the pool side, then you would see like a variation in your hash rate. And since the pool, uh, when it divides the rewards, looks at your, at your hash rate, if I oversimplify the rewarding scheme, at the time the, the block found, uh, the block has been found by the pool, then you may see a variation in your rewards. So this can be directly manifested. But another incentive that I would see for pools to implement this feature is also the security part, which we didn't cover yet at all. I was just speaking about the man in the middle, but we try to uh, propose uh, an, a, a, basically an industry standard extension based on noise protocol framework, which is a well-proven uh, you know, cryptographic, framework to build uh, handshake protocols. It's being used by Lightning Network and WhatsApp and, and many other. Uh, and it's essentially a platform that allows you to generate a handshake protocol that you like without making mistakes uh, and the security flaws. It's built, it's built on modern crypto. So all, all the um, communication eventually after the handshake is done is uh, encrypted and it's using authenticated encryption by default. So basically uh, any message that has been tempered uh, can be easily detected and at the same time it's it's encrypted. It's called authenticated encryption with associated data. Uh, yeah. So I, I see, I mean, the, the incentives should be clear. Uh, what I find uh, a little bit challenging is that we need to uh, polish uh, certain things. For example, for the security part, we need to decide how we are going to standardize the way you distribute the, the public key of the pool. Because uh, the whole point of encryption is that it is nice, but it would be worthless if you have no way to verify that the pool that you think you're talking to is the pool that you really wanted to connect to. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in the web world, we have HTTPS where you have some X, X509 certificates. And here we should come up with uh, a little bit more loaded and, uh, you know, more flexible scheme that would not, you know, have all these, uh, you know, administration burdens like, like X509 management has. Uh, so this is the, the only challenging part, which is um, like a precondition to run the, the noise uh, protocol framework protocol that we designed. Great. And as this Stratum V2 has had input as well from uh, Matt Corello, a very well-known Bitcoin developer known for his contributions on uh, many uh, mining related contributions as well, and also a security review by Peter Todd. Have you had any initial feedback from the community or from other industry players? Uh, we're talking to big farms who are actually uh, commenting the docs pretty loudly. Uh, so far, we didn't get any like major comments saying, oh, this is a complete no-go or there's like a huge flaw in the protocol. Uh, but we need to really polish uh, small things. So the, the feedback so far that we got seems positive. The collaboration with Peter and uh, Matt was, uh, I think, beneficial to the whole project because, uh, again, like I said, we do we use better hash as an inspiration for for the decentralization part and Matt does understand that it's important to have uh, an industry standard for the new mining protocol and he's actually one of the co-authors uh, of the of the new standard because we really wanted to get him on board so all this uh, adds credit to to the whole uh, initiative of uh, you know fixing the protocol 
Great. And for any miners and mining pools who are using Stratum, the original protocol, Stratum V1, we might call it, are there any complications around, let's call it backwards compatibility, or is there a layer or some way that uh, these uh, different uh, miners and pools can talk to each other? We, The way we would like to proceed with rolling out the protocol once the standard is stable or considered final uh, is that uh, pools would be pretty much immediately able to provide the V2 service because the, all they would do is they would just put a simple V2 to V1 translating proxy in front of their service. So they would not be risking any software issues or bugs or anything. And this would be like the immediate step. And this would bring uh, immediately the security part and the bandwidth saving part. It would not be, uh, it would still not be able to cover the uh, efficiency improvement on block template distribution because the, the old V1 protocol doesn't support it. And if you just use a simple proxy, it cannot do more than that. But then once this is proven to work, uh, they can you know, start implementing it in, natively into their Stratum servers. And this is exactly what we started doing on Slashpool, where we are already running a V2 to V1 proxy so that miners can actually test uh, the service already. It's on V2 Stratum Slashpool.com. And the next step would be, you know, once once the standard is stable to support uh, the protocol natively inside of the Stratum service with all the benefits. And uh, I guess if we were to just turn to just Bitcoin mining and running a pool a little bit more broadly, can you offer us some insight into what are some of the scalability challenges just running a pool just generally? Uh, well, generally the, <laughs> the scalability challenge is that your pool is... Uh, distributed throughout the globe but at the same time you uh, have to you know collect data from from the whole pool in order to do all the accounting uh, and the challenge is that uh, the connectivity doesn't work out very well globally if you have operations in China and if you have operations in in uh, the US and Europe sometimes you have outages so you have to find your ways around it with uh, redundant connections uh, IPsec links uh, you know that allow you routing through uh, your own traffic uh, and so on. So these are the I think these are the biggest challenges. Even if you try to move over to cloud, we partially use cloud services as well. Uh, it's also not a hundred percent guarantee that you would be a uh, hundred like percent time available. Uh, so you need to diversify, and then you have the problem back because you need to connect those uh, cloud data centers uh, so that they can talk to each other. Uh, so this, I think this is the biggest challenge, basically, uh, trying to uh, make sure your infrastructure uh, retains the connectivity globally. Ah, oh, great. Yeah. Uh, and, and another comment I've seen uh, is this idea that amongst the Bitcoin mining industry, that there are some moves being made amongst pools to try to be more of a one-stop shop for their customers. So they might try and provide hardware needs and financial services needs at, at the same time, rather than just being a traditional pool. Can you offer any of your thoughts on uh, what's your view on that? I think this is definitely the way the industry is moving towards and we are also trying to participate in this movement. So we're trying to work on, uh, on new services uh, that would cover also these areas. Great. Uh, and uh, one other question just around uh, with Bitcoin mining pools and traditionally in the well, coming from like a, even a financial services world or technology world, there is this whole idea of uh, SOC 1 and SOC 2 audits, right? Like technology controls audits. Is that something that you think Bitcoin mining pools would do as well to provide comfort to investors? Or is that something that you don't really see as necessary? Uh, I think it is an uh, interesting area to explore because, uh, you know, Investors uh, who are entering the mining industry are facing uh, a small reality check. Uh, for example, if you try buying uh, mining hardware, how does it work these days? You just pay a lot of money in advance. Is this an industry standard uh, in other domains? I'm not sure about it. So uh, I think uh, those kind of audits uh would be something that could actually be demanded and could be uh, a good you know, product for, for some of the players in the industry, I would say. 
Fantastic. Well, uh, look, I think there are most of the questions I had, uh, but uh, I guess just summarizing my understanding then. So Stratum V2 as a proposal and a protocol, I, I think the main benefits that I can see from our discussion is, well, I guess it helps decentralization of Bitcoin's mining and uh, helping stop that censorship, as we mentioned. It, it helps uh, stop that man in the middle attack. And there's also a bandwidth saving from moving from the JSON format into uh, the Stratum 2 format that's being used. Uh, but I suppose in terms of next steps going forward, what are you mainly looking for? Are you looking for review comments on the protocol document? Are you looking for contributions? What would you like to see from uh, the listeners? Yeah, uh, I would like to see commands. Uh, I think the most uh, important part is to finalize uh, also the security protocol. So basically decide on the cipher suits which currently I think there's only choice of two, which uh, the industry is going towards is the AES and CGM mode and there's the ChaCha 20 poly 1305 or whatever it's called. Uh, one is uh, better on the server side because you have hardware acceleration. The, the other one is better for the arms. So if you, if you wanted to have the, the encryption also on the firmware level, that the second might be a better choice. Uh, but more importantly, we need to uh, really look into what would be the industry standard for distributing the public keys uh, of the pools, sort of like the certificate. And this certificate uh, would be uh, then used by the miners to verify that they're really uh, talking to the pool that they think they're talking to. Uh, this would be for the security thing. Uh, an important part uh, that still needs to get done is uh, changes in the Bitcoin core so that it's able to supply multiple block templates in a more efficient way. Uh, we didn't talk to uh, the topic of um, uh, template distribution protocol today, but this is, this is uh, what it is about. It's essentially a protocol between the Bitcoin core and, and, and the, the provider of the jobs uh, so that the job provider is receiving a stream of uh, Bitcoin jobs that he can provide to the miners to negotiate. So this needs to be, this still needs to be designed and implemented on the Bitcoin core side. But the, the, the protocol itself has been outlined. So the challenges would be on the Bitcoin core developer side. That's about it. Okay, great. Well, uh, look, I think that's, uh, that's it for today. But uh, Jan, if you could uh, make sure you let the listeners know where they can find you and find the protocol as well. Uh, if you want to research the protocol, just go to stratumprotocol.org. Uh, if you're interested into our open source uh, initiative called Brains OS, go to brains-os.org. Um, if you want to check out our pool, just go to slushpool.com. And you can find me on Twitter under Jan Brains. Fantastic. Well, that's that's awesome. Uh, it's been very educational for me. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me in your show. Hopefully I was not being too technical, but I mean, this deserves it a little bit. I hope you found that useful. And if you did, make sure you leave me a review on your favorite podcast platform. Otherwise, find the website stefanlevera.com. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the Citadels. Mm-hmm.